Hi everyone, today I am here to do the first part of my April wrap up. Now normally I only do one wrap up, but this is the first month that I've ever felt compelled, more specifically felt it necessary to divide it, my wrap up into two parts because I have read a lot of things so far already and I don't want to burden you with like a 45 minute wrap up at the end of the month. So I figured I would try to divide this into multiple parts. So I'm first going to briefly mention the graphic novels that I have read, which I'm hoping to compile into a separate graphic novel wrap up later on in the month. So I will just briefly mention here that I have read Snot Girl Volume 1 by Brian Lee O'Malley, Honor Girl by Maggie Thrash, and Blue is the Warmest Color by Julie Moreau. On to the other books that I finished this month, I want to start off with Cork Dork by Bianca Bosker. This is a book that has been on my radar for about a year. I was first compelled to read it when Olive reviewed it on her channel, and my interest was reignited recently when I was listening through back episodes of the So Many Damn Books podcast. They had Bianca Bosker on as a guest, and they talked about Cork Dork, and she has also discussed wine a little bit on that podcast, and it reminded me, oh yeah, I am really interested in that as a topic. I listened to it on audio, which I think was a very fun way to listen to it because like most audiobooks narrated by their authors, it just feels like a friend is talking to you, which is really, really nice. The conceit is she was a tech journalist and she felt a little disillusioned with life, a little disconnected, and she decided to try to become a certified sommelier in one year. There is a whole certification process for sommeliers and of course a lot of skill and technique and training that goes into being a sommelier. Not only do you need to be well versed in wine, able to taste it and understand it, but also to be able to differentiate different wines based on geography, acidity, alcohol content, and there's also the side of service, which is a whole set of procedures and practices that sommeliers and like fine dining establishments employ to make the dining experience seem like this really extravagant, over the top almost experience that is often only reserved for the very rich. She goes through her experience learning how to learn about wine because she, like most of us, would sniff a glass of wine and say, yep, that smells like wine, um, and how to actually find those tasting notes that we experience when we taste or smell a wine and how to not only identify them, but to appreciate them, not only in the glass, but also in real life as well. She talks to other sommeliers, she talks to scientists. She has the extreme privilege of going to a very exclusive $1,500 a plate dinner where everyone brings a treasure from their own wine collection and t passes around tastes for everybody. But she also does things like goes to one of the main manufacturers of wine who does like Yellowtail or Sutter Sutterholm um, and mass produces those sorts of wines that will appeal to the everyday palate and whether or not those are good wines or bad wines and how different experts in the fields of science and sommeliers would describe and differentiate good wines versus bad wines and what makes a good wine and what makes a bad wine how diverse those opinions are. If you think a wine tastes good, that might be good enough. There probably isn't too much of a difference between a $50 bottle of wine and a $500 bottle of wine in terms of taste and quality, but other factors such as prestige and the scarcity of the grape or the scarcity of that vintage may or may not affect the price of the wine. And does that matter to you? It might. And this is all fascinating to me. I would describe myself pretty much as a beer drinker. I really like beer. Beer is my alcoholic beverage of choice, nine times out of 10. So I know basically nothing about wine and I'm one of those people who will just get a rosé on the menu because I know that I kind of like rosés, but I don't know anything about what makes a rosé or why I like it. And this book made me stop and think a little bit about what I look for in a wine and made me want to try and appreciate things more. Try and pick up some of those tasty notes and to keep track of what I like and don't like in a wine and perhaps experiment a little bit more with this thing that I have found to be very largely intimidating and honestly quite elitist. So I think the book was very successful in not necessarily converting me into a wine person, but making me at least open to the idea and the experience of it. I went to Target, I bought a bottle of wine. It was a rosé with a pun name, so it probably wasn't super great, but I enjoyed it all the same and I was inspired to do this by that book. And Target is probably not the best way to buy wine, but it was the closest place that I could do it. So I would highly recommend Cork Dork if you're looking for a work of accessible nonfiction. It's a memoir. It's also quite funny and light, but also quite informative and I think 
with her background as a journalist, she was mindful to encapsulate a bunch of different angles and perspectives on wine to get as well-rounded a narrative as she could in her year's experience. I found it very compelling, compulsively listenable. Now onto the physical books that I have finished so far this month. A couple of these I did also listen to on audio, but I have the physical copies here, so I've just arranged them that way. So with these, I'm just gonna do least favorite to favorite because that's the way that I like to do things. We're going to start with a possibly controversial and unpopular opinion, but oh well. And my least favorite novel that I finished so far this month was definitely Emma by Jane Austen. I am a big fan of Pride and Prejudice. Not so much the movies, I mean the BBC adaptation is fantastic, but I really love the book itself, the words on the page that Jane Austen herself wrote. I find myself swept up in the romance. I think that Mr. Darcy is super charming. I think it's hilarious. I love the Bennet family, especially the play between Mr. Bennet and Mrs. Bennet, but this is not a review of Pride and Prejudice. I just want to provide some background in that I have appreciated and even loved a Jane Austen novel in the past, and that is my only experience with Jane Austen before. So I was trying to figure out what Jane Austen to read next, and I found a blog online that had a suggestion on which order to read Jane Austen's work. First was Pride and Prejudice, and second was Emma. And I already had it, so I figured, all right, I'll give Emma a try. Emma is the story of Emma Woodhouse. She comes from a rather privileged background and, well, not interested in romance herself. She is very interested in the romance of those around her. And she often match makes different couples in her head and even tries to match make them in real life and is quite nosy in that way. And at the very beginning of the novel, Emma's maid gets married and leaves the house. And it's described as this great tragedy, mostly for the maid and not for Emma because they were such good friends and like, she's gonna really miss out on Emma and like be so sad without her. Okay. So Emma needs another poor person to hang out with and finds a friend and tries to set her up with people for most of the book and also has an antagonistic relationship with a gentleman. And she has a hypochondriac father who shows up every now and again to worry about things, especially Emma leaving the house. And so it's just a lot of upper class drama. And to me, some of the charm of Pride and Prejudice is that while they were very clearly like still quite a privileged family because they had you know, house servants and stuff. They were more middle class. They were more relatable in that way. Emma is clearly rich and she looks down on people who aren't and she's really nosy and very entitled. And I just think that I was kind of put off from the very beginning when the book describes this great loss for the maid who no longer gets to have the pleasure of Emma's company and also like cleaning her house and stuff. I get that that's supposed to be probably humorous, but the humor didn't really land for me and I didn't find any of the characters to be particularly appealing and I did not root for the relationship at all. I could see it coming from a mile away. I know how this goes. I've never seen an adaptation of Emma or anything. I just could see it happening. It was not uh, ambiguous at all who she was going to end up with. But I didn't care and I didn't find either of them, the love interests, to be interesting or relatable. I just didn't care about them. So I found myself wanting to skim a lot of this book, especially a lot of the little side plots that don't really go anywhere because I just found them to be a little bit tiresome. So Emma did not work for me. I hope that other Jane Austen wor books work for me more than this. Like I love this, the movie of Sense and Sensibility, so I'm hoping maybe the book will also work for me. But there's something here that just did not land. This is one that I listened to on audio and it was another disappointing read and it was Bonfire by Kristen Ritter. I also mentioned this in my Goodreads review, but I have no attachment to Kristen Ritter. I don't think of her as Jessica Jones because I have not watched Jessica Jones, nor will I ever watch Jessica Jones. I do not care about Marvel properties at all. I don't have any uh, like sentimental attachment to Kristen Ritter as a person, as an actress, as a character. So I read this just like I would any other book. I don't want to make assumptions on anyone else's enjoyment of the book. You're allowed to enjoy it for whatever reasons you want. But I feel like a lot of people's really high praise of this book comes at least in part from the fact that they like her as Jessica Jones. I don't know if that's true, but I just didn't think this book was really that remarkable and she probably got a book deal because of her growing fame. That is probably too harsh, but Let's just get on to what the book is about. Our protagonist is a lawyer named Abby Williams who grew up in a really small town, but was able to escape it and become a successful lawyer in Chicago. However, a case has brought her back to her small town that involves a local factory and whether or not it has been polluting the water. And she and a team of lawyers from her firm are going to try and figure out whether or not they have a case and whether or not this company has been causing 
environmental damages on the town and the people in the town. But this is all wrapped up in Abby's own past because she's returning home and she had a complicated relationship with home because of course she did. And she had a complicated relationship with her classmates because of course she did. And so she has to run into all those people again and reacquaint herself with the town. To me, the plot was rather thin and was not very memorable, seeing as that I don't remember a lot about it. And it was only a couple of weeks ago that I read this, but even worse than that though, I thought the writing was rather weak. She, no fewer than three times, uses a version of the phrase, I let out a breath, I didn't know I was holding. I mean, I don't abhor that phrase, but it happened three times. And every time it just felt like nails on a chalkboard. I just, it really screamed at me as like a glaring, really bad writing mistake. And there's also a quite large revelation later, and this is not a spoiler, that she did not come home for the case, but she actually came home to help like uncover a part of herself. And it's just like, okay, you can use that as a symbol, but when you literally have to spell that out for your readers, either you really don't have a high estimation of your reader's uh, ability to be able to detect symbolism, which to me feels like kind of an insult on your readership, or you don't have confidence in your own writing to get across like the point of your book, <laughs> which either way, I don't think is very good and should have been edited out. I just don't think that there's a lot of strength in this writing. The character was very wishy-washy. I did not have a good sense of her at all. She was constantly changing her opinions from one to a polar opposite. Like I thought this, but now I definitely think this. Oh, you know what? I was wrong. I actually think that other thing again flipping back and forth so much on her opinions and her convictions and her like deepest, most profound beliefs that I was getting whiplash trying to keep up. And I didn't think that the twists were that interesting and I didn't find any emotional connection to any of the characters at all. So I think that this was just like a giant letdown. Uh, if you like thrillers uh, an awful lot, you might get something out of this, but I, as a casual consumer of thrillers, the ones of the more literary variety found this to be definitely below average. And I, I could not recommend it. I just don't get what people think is so special about this, other than the fact that it was written by an actress and they're like, hey, this actress can kind of write, neat. And I don't think that you deserve a cookie for that. Also, the, the audiobook isn't even read by Kristen Ritter, so like, what's the point? Now on to uh, some less vitriolic reviews. These are all books that I really enjoyed to varying degrees starting with Happy by Nicola Barker. This I picked up because of the Women's Prize for Fiction. It was long listed and it also won the Goldsmiths Prize, which I don't know what that prize is, but good for it, I guess. And this is one of the few on the Women's Prize long list that really stuck out to me is one that I was interested in reading and had been keen to read it before it was on that list. So this was what pushed me over the edge to it. And I really enjoyed it, although I don't think I fully understood it, which is sort of my experience with House of Leaves. Like I would really think of Happy as a combination of House of Leaves by Mark C. Danielewski, Harmony by Project Ito, which are both books that I've read and enjoyed to varying degrees. I like really, really liked Harmony as a work of speculative fiction. This is a novel where nanotechnology has progressed to the point where like all diseases have been eradicated and people supposedly live in a utopian society. But there is a group of three girls who are trying to kind of rebel against government control and try to uh, die by suicide through starvation and sort of the consequences of that and just like a discussion of government intervention in our bodies and our autonomy. Very, very interesting. I read and reviewed it years ago, so I can't vouch for the quality of the review, but this book is really interesting. And then House of Leaves, which is famous for its strange and unique structure, which at the time when it was published in the early 2000s seemed like a very novel concept. Stuff like this happening throughout, and it is quite interesting. Um, and and if trip to read. So this is sort of a combination of those two things. For this is a novel about a character named Mira A, and she lives in a society where everything is closely monitored by the government, and everything is sort of neutral. Uh, they tried to eliminate use of thoughts or words that are overly emotional and in either polarity, positive or negative. And they're tracked on this like public graph that everyone can see. So there is a graph of like the whole society and it's supposed to stay level. And peaks in the graph for these bursts of, of emotion, basically in vocalization, show up on the public graph, which obviously is bad because everyone wants to keep the graph as neutral as possible because society has dictated that is the best way to live. But also everyone has their own individual graphs. So you can mark fluctuations in behavior and emotion in individuals as well. And it's all generally pretty public, which is sort of the conceit of the novel. And it's difficult to talk about what the plot of the novel is without giving too much away. Because it's kind of fun to uncover how things came to be and the rationalization for this existence. It's interesting to see that happen and 
evolve on the page and you also get to see changes in the graph visualized by changes in the color of words. You're not going to be able to see this from here probably, but words like brash, threat, obtuse, oppression, corporations, liberty, manipulate, dangerous, weapon, explosive, wanton, those all show up in varying colors as like infractions on this world. And like good speculative fiction, it made me turn inward to our society and the way that it functions and what could prompt changes like this to happen in society and whether or not they would be good or bad things to happen. One passage that really stuck out to me was, in the past, people were suddenly able to make instant connections for a golden period, at least before the onset of the slow epoch, when the corporations bought up and owned all the seeds, all growth, all hope, all water, all clean air, all assets, all thought. During this golden period, the old were, were completely awash with facts and non-facts. They asked a question and it was promptly answered. A fountainhead of information was released. But was the water clean? Did it quench, revive, or simply deluge? Did it not often threaten to saturate and drown? We've constrained the fountainhead. We have not stopped it, but we have inhibited it. We have redirected its flow. The young accept that this is necessary. To be unconstrained, to expect total liberty, is not a healthy or a fruitful way to coexist. So just interesting little tidbits like that. Very thought provoking. Um, like I said, I don't think I understood it all at times, but it was a really curious read. It was definitely a weird one and certainly not for everyone, but I really enjoyed it. And it was refreshing coming off the heels of Sight by Jesse Greengrass, which is another women's prize long listed book that I tried to read but couldn't even finish. Next, I want to briefly talk about The Leavers by Lisa Ko, which is another one that I listened to on audio. I've been trying to listen to books on audio that I currently own on my shelves just to hopefully get through things a little bit quicker. And I thought this was a great work on audio. The novel itself does have two narrators, a mother and a son, and I wish that it had had separate narrators in the audiobook that would have helped to differentiate the characters and I always love that little touch but this is narrated by one narrator and I do think she did a good job so not to trash her performance I just wish that there had been two. So The Leavers is two stories one of Polly Guo who is a Chinese immigrant living in the United States she is working as a nail tech and she has a young son named Ming and she is doing everything she can as a single mother to make ends meet. But she doesn't have a lot of money and living in New York City is quite expensive. So she talks of moving perhaps to Florida to get a better job. Shortly after mentioning wanting to move to Florida, Doming's mother, Polly, completely disappears. And Doming is left to wonder whether or not she has left him. And the circumstances behind Polly's disappearance are left intentionally ambiguous. And you don't quite find out for quite a long time in the narrative what happens to her. So Polly disappears and Doming is left in the care of a couple of Polly's friends that they had lived with, but they cannot afford to have another mouth to feed without Polly's income. So they put Deming up for adoption and he ends up in the care of a white family. They give him the name Daniel and raise him as they would any white child. And they remove him from New York City to a very small, very white little town in upstate New York. Then we also see Daniel's perspective when he is in college and he is struggling with a gambling addiction, but also with this tease that he might figure out what happens to his mother. Um, so you see Doming both as a 10 year old boy and as a young adult trying to grapple with the loss of his mother and this complete feeling of abandonment and also trying to incorporate into a completely different way of life, different people, different culture. It's a very heartbreaking story. Daniel describes in great detail his feelings of abandonment and loss and his disconnection from his family. I think it's toxic to too often talk about adoptive families as being so totally separate and can never be the real family because adoptive families can be completely legitimate and become the true the true parents of the children that they adopt and the, the toxic notion that the biological parents are always going to be the real and most valid and most deser deserving parents because that is often not the case and we often don't, don't hear stories of adoption um, where the adoptive parents get the legitimacy that they deserve. So this could be a potential stumbling block in this book if you're looking for an adoption narrative that doesn't frame the adoptive parents as sort of negative and not as legitimate. But Daniel was 10 years old when he was adopted and, and was very suddenly removed from his mother. So his viewing of his, his adoptive family as not being his legitimate family or his real family makes more sense to me. But I think it's a weird gray area that I wish had been discussed a little more that is pretty much glazed over. And Polly is always referred to as Daniel or Duming's real, real mother. Um, and that phrase is used a lot. But I thought it was a very emotional story hearing about 
the losses on both Polly and Doming's or Daniel's sides um, and how they view family and view relationships and are also grappling with great, a lot of really heavy topics like addiction and code switching and exploring different cultures and immigration. Um, illegal immigration is a topic that comes up in this book as well. So I think that it is a very relevant book and a very emotionally resonant one. I cared for the characters quite a lot, although I feel like Polly and Daniel were the only two characters that were fleshed out a lot, and a lot of the side characters felt a little bit thin. I wish that they had maybe been fleshed out a little bit more as well. Really, really enjoyed it a lot. I would highly recommend it. I think it was long listed for the National Book Award last year, and I still don't think it got a lot of hype even despite that. So I would love more people to read and discuss this book. Strong work of literary fiction. And the last novel I'm going to talk about is Infomocracy by Malka Older. I was very kindly sent this by Tor in the summer of 2016 and unfortunately did not get around to it before the election and then felt completely emotionally unprepared to read it after the election because it deals directly in elections and I just wasn't ready. But I felt like now is the time, the election is pretty far behind us and while we are still very much dealing with the real implications of that every single day, uh, I felt emotionally safe enough to read this book. And it kind of blew my mind because in a lot of ways it was very strangely prophetic about the 2016 election and also potential implications in the future for how technology and politics can intersect and influence one another. It takes place in a future world where there is a sort of global democracy. Every 10 years, the entire world votes on a governing body democratically to rule over the world, um, to govern the world, I guess is a better way to phrase it. But also because it would be unwise and you know, frankly shitty to have one governing body rule over the whole literal world, they also have divided the world into micro-democracies. Every pocket of 100,000 people has its own governing democracy, and in these 10-year elections also vote who their governing body is going to be, and it might match the supermajority governing party, or it could be a local government. So basically you get to vote on your local government and the global government every 10 years. So we are on the precipice of the next election, and we are following a uh, character who works for information, which is basically like Super Google, provides the technology and the information for the whole world. Um, everyone has devices that access information. It's also the means through which people communicate, and it also is sort of like your social media. So it, information is if Google Plus was an effective social media platform and everyone used it. And everyone in the world had mobile devices that from which they could access this power. So there is a, an, sort of secret agent cyberpunk lady named Mishma who works for information and is trying to uncover potential voter fraud. And we are also following Ken who works for one of the governing bodies who is up for be becoming the, the global leader called Policy First, which is a very unique democratic institution where there's no face of the organization. There's no like one leader. They are completely governing based on policy. And there are some other French characters as well, but those are our two protagonists dealing with potential voter fraud and potential risks on the precipice of the next election um, and the campaigning involved and the risks that having this all happen technologically have us potentially face. It brought up the ideas that I hadn't thought about a lot before the election, like echo chambers and, and just generally different ways of thinking about democracy and politics and elections. So here is an example, just a passage that um, was funny and a little sad. You don't vote. The girl's tone rises with the incred incredulity of someone who has sucked up every mag article and vidlet about this being the event of the decade, the election of the century, the most important vote yet, a chance to establish the established order, blah, 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 blah. Her echo chamber of friends and rivals does not include non-voters. She's come to the supposed voter res registration rally not only because it's the best party on tonight in the greater Rio de la Plata area, but also because it feels like virtuous pleasure, an exciting civic duty with a built-in conversation starter. In sum, a semi-sentient being experiencing the first election she can vote in. That to me really reminded me of the feeling of going to the women's march and how it's not just a you know, civic duty or a, a political stance, but also it's like really exciting and on trend and the dangers of that and how superficial it can seem. Other things like, Opening the borders, such borders as remained anyway, allowed the new governments to pull in more like-minded people, consolidating their holds on their sentinels for the next election and stretching into neighboring ones as populations surged. Some journalists two decades ago dubbed it the process of mandergerying, although it is also known as reverse osmosis because it results in greater concentrations of like-minded and, on occasion, racially and ethnically alike constituents. 
And then also, moving on, Mishma reads the notes from the session on name recognition problem. There was a study done with minimally educated voters who, given a hypothetical ballot, picked the names of famous serial killers over randomly generated names, as well as over those of actual less known politicians. Most of the discussion among the information workers was about how to increase the name recognition of the politicians and governments in this election, or whether there's any way to evaluate the exact degrees of name recognition different actors have, or even, and here the conversation gets very tentative and hypothetical, weight the voting accordingly. Like, that made me think, hmm, perhaps name recognition with uneducated voters perhaps influenced the way that they voted in the 2016 election. Who is to say? It was prophetic and thought-provoking in a lot of ways, which I really, really enjoyed and don't think I would have enjoyed as much if I had read this much closer to the election when I felt much more tender uh, and insensitive about these things. Not to say that they don't still deeply bother me or that I'm not, like, politically aware anymore. I just, like, am a little bit numb to it, I guess, which probably isn't great either, but that's all to say I was... I feel like I read this at the right time where I was removed enough from the election to have really enjoyed and, and found pleasure from these intellectual ideas and conversations that I was having with the book, but still am politically engaged enough and informed enough, I think, to have had those conversations and insights be meaningful. And then there's also a lot of like cyberpunk action and uh, conspiracies and, and there's a lot going on. This is not just like a dense political discourse and musings. There is a really thrilling sci-fi plot also happening at the same time. So I think that this would be perfect if you are interested in sci-fi novels, cyberpunk novels. For those reasons, I really enjoyed it. I would definitely recommend it and I'm very much looking forward to the subsequent books in the series. The second one is already out but the third one is not. So I'll probably just wait for the third one to be released and then buy them both and then read them in one fell swoop. Those are the things that I've read in the first half of the month which is bonkers. I've been reading so much. I mentioned a few weeks ago that I you know, I'm unemployed and I'm kind of in between things right now and I felt guilty that I wasn't reading a lot because I was, you know, feeling a little anxious, a little, little depressive maybe, but that kind of inspired me the fact that like, why am I not reading a book a day? So I haven't quite reached a book a day status, but I'm trying to read at least one every two days. It's been really, really fun, so I've been very much enjoying it, but I wanted to get this video out now so that my, again, my wrap up was not like five hours long. So I hope that you enjoyed this. I'd love to hear if you have read any of these books and your thoughts on them or any recommendations for me based on what I shared today and anything else that you have to say, also welcome. And other than that, thank you all so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.